in this episode of Mind Pump. So in this episode, we answer questions asked by listeners like you. What they do is they go to our Instagram page, Mind Pump, on Instagram, and they ask us questions under the Qua meme. We pick our favorite ones, and then we answer them. But we also open these episodes with our introductory conversation. This is where we have a lot of fun. We talk about current events, studies, um, and we tend to mess with each other mm. in that first portion. Introductory. Here's what we talked about in this episode. We start out by talking about why Adam is walking funny. <laughs> what the hell is going on here? Yeah. He's got a weird wobble in his Big step. Big weekend, huh? Then we talked about the Instagram debate uh, or discussion we had with our good friend Eugene Tao. He's a smart dude. He made a post that said, uh, you don't need to squat, bench, or deadlift. Uh, actually, it was a little bit more controversial than just that. Mm. So we talk all about why we think most people should I squat, disagree. bench, and deadlift. Then we talked about the Epstein autopsy. Uh, believe it or not, another autopsy came out, and the, uh, the the forensics person that did it said, he might have been murdered. Whoa. Yeah, who would have, who would have believed that? Strange. Uh, I talked about the recent podcast that was aired uh, where I was interviewed by Max Lugavere on The Genius Life. This podcast, we went off. We talked about uh, counting macros and calories and why you don't need to do that. We also gave a rundown of the Game Changers documentary. So if you want to know what our opinion is, go check that out. Then we talked about how Organifi is our favorite vegan supplement company. That's because we were talking about the Game, game Changers. Now we have a discount for you. Again, Organifi makes vegan supplements like protein powders, Green juices and red juices and a gold juice. They have a product called Pure, which is a nootropic-based gut health supplement. Um, you get 20% off if you use the Mind Pump discount. Here's what you do. Go to Organifi.com forward slash Mind Pump. Use the code Mind Pump for the 20% off. Then we talked about 24-hour fitness. This is the place where we all went to school back in the day, but it looks like they might be tanking. Yeah. Uh, and then we talked about Sad the show. Story. Silicon Valley on HBO. I haven't seen it, but Justin said it's rad. You got to check it out. Then we answered some fitness questions. Here's the first one. What are the differences between a beginner, intermediate, and advanced lifter? Like, How do you categorize them? Next question. This person wants us to break down the difference and benefits or detriments of the strict overhead press versus the push press. The next question was, uh, what are our opinions on training a muscle that is still sore. Like, should you train it or should you skip it? And the final question skip we answered, it. this person wants to know what our thoughts were on processed versus non-processed foods, even if the macros were the same. So proteins, fats, carbs, and calories are the same. What are the benefits, detriments, or is it the same when it comes to processed versus unprocessed foods? Also, you are entering into the final hours of one of the biggest promotions Do -do -do -do. of the year, MAPS Anabolic, our flagship fitness program designed to build muscle, speed up the metabolism, strengthen your body. This is the program that most people get started on with us. It's definitely our most popular one. It's 50% off. So if you're listening to this episode right when we dropped it, you're lucky. There's some time left for the 50% off discount. Here's what you got to do. Do it now. Go to mapsred.com and use the code Red 50, R-E-D-5-0, no space for the discount. You're entering the gain zone. Dude, one of the drawbacks, there's not very many drawbacks to wearing the European cut underwear that I like to wear. <laughs> oh, Lord. Here you, we know, go. you guys know what I'm talking about. I've seen them. Because they're- I roomed with you before. They're the least restrictive, right? They keep everything free. Yeah. Are they the least restrictive or oh, the most restrictive? No, free, bro. Everything's out. <sighs> The only thing that's being held in place is the important part. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like it's, uh, I feel like boxers the twig and be no, no, boxers are too flowy. Too like, flow. go, yeah, go sprint in boxers. Watch what happens. Yeah. Yeah, that's why it would I make I kind of like the breeze, though. That's I why like I like the crosswind. That's why I would think it would be the, the least restrictive. No, what I sh you're right. What I should say is they're the most- Functional? Yeah, they're designed the best. <laughs> you know, they, keep, they keep what you need held- yeah. Everything else is free. I mean, I mean it's kind of like lady briefs. Though. But here's the... Huh? Uh? <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not. I, not at all, but it kind of looks briefs. like you're in a bikini. Yeah. It, 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 well, I mean... So. It is. Anyways, there's, there's so, that. So here's the bad part. Every once in a while, you get a wedgie. 
Oh yeah, yeah. So, you, so you have a thong on right now? <laughs> yeah, and I'm not. I can't fix it because we started a podcast. So I'm already can't, on camera. Can't start picking at it. I'm already yeah. on. If I move, yeah, it's, it's not going to be. Everyone's going to know. It's not going to be good, dude. You know what's well, funny? You brought it up. Yeah, what? you know what's hilarious? What's hilarious? Watching Adam get in his truck. Oh god! <laughs> right now, <laughs> right little, now, bro. A little leg sore uh, bro, this morning. Huh? Why you, I can't. Why are you walking like that? God, I can't remember <laughs> the last time I was this sore. I mean, you know, it's funny is. You know, this is since probably the original oh. three programs. I haven't like followed a protocol to a T, and I I said, okay, when we do, when I do this powerlifting program, I'm gonna just follow it to a T. Just trust the process, go through it. Uh, those that don't know, uh, this is actually the first program that I haven't been involved in. Like I was, I wasn't here when the guys created it with with Ben Pollock. And so that's part of why I was excited. Like, okay, cool. I, you know, I'm literally going through it. Let's see what I'm in for. What if we gave yeah. Adam a fake one? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what it felt like. like yeah. oh, I bet it'll do this. Because oh. yeah. normally what I would do is I'd go off of how I feel. I, I mean, we've been doing this for so long now. I know when I'm getting after it in a workout, I know when I'm really overreaching. And this is like, okay, I'm just kind of whatever about all that. I'm just going to follow the programming and see how I feel. And so I am just sore as fuck right yeah. now. Well, you went into it uh, with a week off. Yeah, already. I was. Uh, yeah, I was deconditioned. I think. It, I think if you're coming off of one of our other programs, if you're coming off of anabolic or aesthetic or split or one of our other pro programs, and then you transition right into powerlift, you'll be fine. That's but, what it was designed. For. That's how we wrote it. Because when we wrote it with Ben, yeah, we told him we said, okay, we want to design. A program that gets fit people who already work out from where they're at to powerlifter competition yeah, we ready. We want to stretch them a little bit. Yeah, to powerlifting competition ready. Yeah. And here's the thing: I've never trained purely like a powerlifter. I've trained with a lot of the concepts and principles around it, but not, never trained. Yeah. And I've never really trained uh, like all the way. I've never trained a client for a powerlifting competition. I'm, I'm aware of of the the principles and techniques and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I have had friends who who were experienced lifters, very experienced, advanced, who are strong, go to a powerlifting gym or follow a powerlifting protocol and add like 30, 40 pounds to like a squat, which yeah. is insane. No, yeah. me too. I've heard this, the same thing. So that's why I'm just kind of, I'm, uh, you know, blindly following it no, no matter what. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I'm definitely feeling it. Uh, paying for it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I'm paying for it for these, these Didn't Jordan days. Jordan Syatt, he when he went to um God, where'd he go? What's West the side? famous? There you go. Yeah. He went to West Side and he added like a hundred and something pounds to his deadlift or something like that, or even more. Yeah, it was more than that. It was crazy. And he he's already was already advanced. I mean that's the thing about powerlifting training. It's very uh, objective and it's tested because well, it either works or doesn't. Well, and it's very specific. Like I've never programmed this specific for that. Like yeah. I've always like, oh, I want to get a better deadlift or, oh, I want my squat to improve. And so along those lines- So I've, like including it in your- Right. So then I, I take some of the powerlifting principles and I integrate it into my already like bodybuilder type of routine- uh, but never have I just said, okay, I'm really focused on the three yeah. big lifts and let's see what I, uh, speaking of that, um, our boy Eugene yesterday with his- Oh, Tal? Yeah. With his L post. A little bit of controversy. Yeah. You know, it's so funny. I, you know, I really like him. Like he- he He's we, a good guy. <clears throat> yeah. We were DMing back and forth last night and I told him, I said, yeah, I saw your, cause he was just like, man, boy, did that post stir it up big. And I said, yeah, no, I saw what you did there. He said something like people who squat, bench, and deadlift all the time or something like that. Maybe you could read it, Adam. Yeah. I don't want to butcher it. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll, re I'll read it. Um, you know, and it, what what Eugene is really good at is he's really good at stirring the pot like that. I mean, it's got 912 comments on it. It's got almost 10,000 likes. He said, most of the people doing barbell back squats, bench press, and conventional deadlifts would get far better results if they stopped doing barbell squats, bench press, and conventional deadlifts. Mm. Which is a, a, a total controversial statement, especially uh, talking to us, right? Because we, uh, we just did an episode that was like, you should do those three mm -hmm. lifts. <laughs> yeah. yeah those <laughs> you know, the core foundational so, lifts. And of, and of course, anybody who's been following uh, Mind Pump for a really long time, uh, and they also follow Eugene because uh, he's been featured on our YouTube channel and we're friends. Mm. And he's uh, a smart dude. Yeah, no, totally. And so everybody, and I saw it this morning. You actually brought it up yesterday morning when you saw it. You said, "You see what Eugene posted?" And I'm like, "No, what did he do?" I already, I already know that he did something that would probably cause uh, a lot of discussion. Which I, I like. 
I like that because he he does explain himself really well, and and it does create good uh, conversation and debate. And he's not uh, he doesn't attack people that attack him on there. No, he, I went on there and I challenged him, and we had a civil, smart uh, debate. I I don't fully agree with him. I don't think he fully agrees with me, um, but he makes good points. And I mean, here the thing that I think is important to understand with exercises is this: like let's let's forget arguing. Squats, deadlifts, and bench press for a second. Let's ask anybody who's been training people for a long time the following question. Is there a hierarchy of exercises? Okay. Are some exercises more, just generally more effective than others? Now, I, now I want to preface this by saying that not, every exercise is not for every person. Okay. So, yes, there's always going to be a variance. There's always individual uh, applications when it comes to exercise, 100%. So, but barring that, I'm speaking generally, <clears throat> are some exercises just generally more effective than others? Now, for people who are thinking, we're like, no, it depends or whatever. Okay, I'll give you an extreme example. Um, is a one legged banded leg extension going to be as effective as developing strength and muscle and calorie burn and everything as a barbell squat? Of course not. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody's going to argue that. Okay. Well, we know the extremes. I think everybody can agree on the extremes in terms of the hierarchy of exercises. Well, at the top, there's still some very good and effective exercises, but some of them are at the top and some of them are a little bit lower. Yeah. And the widespread consensus among coaches, among trainers, among very experienced lifters, widespread consensus, meaning not all but most, will tell you that the barbell squat, the barbell deadlift, and I'll argue that the bench press is probably not as important as those two, but definitely the barbell squat and barbell deadlift, those are among the best exercises that most people can do. And some people will not, and I'll, I'll stand by the statement all day long, some people will not reach their full potential if they don't do them. Some people can only reach their full potential for strength and function by doing those those very effective uh, exercises. Yeah. And so that's just my – Well, I, it's I, interesting to watch because it's definitely pulled more on the bodybuilding side because I've, I've seen lots of arguments like for unilateral training being superior to bilateral training with barbells from the strength coach side, you know, from athletics. that world, from athletics. And, you know, and there's some compelling arguments in that direction in terms of longevity and, and really keeping your, your athletes healthy and – uh, risk versus reward, and you can kind of go down that that rabbit hole. But when you're bringing up the most effective, uh, you know, time tested exercises that produce the most strength gains, it's it's really hard to convince me otherwise. Uh, you know, stray me away from those, other than whatever little uh, you, you know compensations or things that exist within that individual that we have to account for. Well, I, I responded to it and I said I like this post because there's a lot of truth behind it. I dislike this post because it validates those looking for an excuse not to do the big three because they're hard. Part of the unseen value of prioritizing the big lifts is the learning curve it takes to get at those lifts. Yep. So, and that's and the and the reason and it's funny because some people there's there's a there's a kid on there right now that's actually a, you can tell he's a young PT who's siding with Eugene and I'm and that's exactly the person why I don't like the post is because I was that person. I was a 22 year old kid who read the same, same books as Eugene's reading. I'm the same kid who, who, who's heard that information and went, Oh, I knew I didn't have to do these squats and deadlifts. I'm just going to stick to leg pressing and lunging and leg extensions on all these other exercises and build muscle. And I did, I totally trained that way. And I, and I left that out. But because of that, there's a lot of things that ended up, I know, hurting me and hurting my clients because I didn't teach them to work towards squatting and deadlifting. And there's a lot of value in, oh, wow, I'm not good at squatting. Oh, I'm not good at deadlifting. Why am I not good at those movements? Unpacking that, addressing all the possible dysfunction and balances that's going on and working towards that. And the truth is, it is hard. It is going to take probably a long time to get good at it, but the lessons that you get from working towards that are incredible. And then the argument that came back was, you know, well, why not just goblet squat? Well, I mean, you could goblet squat, but then you could and, and you could elevate your heels. You could crutch your ankle mobility, and you could not work on your thoracic mobility, and you could do a movement that builds muscle in the legs, arguably almost as well as a squat. That's a good argument. But what I would say is, 
why not try and get that person who can't barbell squat because they have poor thoracic mobility and they have poor ankle mobility to address the poor ankle mobility, the poor thoracic mobility over time and work towards having a good barbell sure, squat. And I think it's a little bit of cheating to say, why not do another type of squat? Okay. They're so similar. They're still both squats. The value of a barbell squat is you're able to load a lot of weight on your back. The problem with the goblet squat is you start to become limited by the weak, the weaker uh, players uh, in that lift, maybe your arms or your shoulders or your hands. So that's what makes a barbell squat, one of the reasons why a barbell squat is so effective. And I'll say this, when we give advice or when you listen to the, you know, our opinion, what you have to consider is why, how we came to the conclusion, okay? We did not come to this cl conclusion solely because we did these exercises and noticed them on ourselves. That's part of the, the reason, but that's a small part. Most of the reason why we have our opinions is based on training hundreds or thousands by proxy, because we did train lots of trainers who train lots of clients, and we oversaw those uh, programs. We also managed gyms, and we saw people working out. And we also trained hundreds of people ourselves, everyday, regular people. And that trumps anything you can, anything else, okay? If your experience is training a bunch of advanced athletes, great. You've got experience training advanced athletes. Uh, so now you're your opinion is going to be based off that. If you just train yourself, your opinion is quite limited. It's based off training yourself. If you just read a bunch of books and textbooks, well, that's where your experience comes from. But if you're an average person, which the 99% of you listening right now fall in that category, very few people fall in the category of extreme self-aware, you know, athlete. Um, that's the advice uh, that the advice that we give is probably the one that's going to apply to you. And I use this example right here. You know, it's like, you want to travel across the ocean, do you take the guy who or girl who has studied all the navigation ma you know, maps and understands the rotation of the earth and the ocean from learning you know, these things from a textbook, or do you go with the guy or girl who's actually gone across the ocean hundreds of times? Who are you going to get on that ship with? Who are you going to trust more? And so this is where we get our information. So sometimes it's counter to even what might even seem a bit intuitive because from, an, from a common sense standpoint, an intuitive standpoint, I think you can make an excellent case that you never need to squat or deadlift. I could easily break down the deadlift and be like, well, here's the muscles you're working and you can work them like this. You don't need a deadlift. You can work them this way. Or I could say it's all about tension. The body doesn't know what exercise it's doing. It doesn't know if you're deadlifting. It doesn't know if you're barbell rowing. It doesn't know. What, so all you got to do is create the right tens tension and you're going to build the same amount of muscle. I can say all kinds of different things that might start to make sense. But at the end of the day, after I've trained hundreds of everyday people, it just works. It just deadlifts, squats. They just, for most people, they're the absolute uh, best well, exercises. just to compare it against like a pillar, you know, a, a, a known path of, uh, of strength. Like this is, this is a standard of strength that I know, yes, I can, I can like alter that, that type of exercise to meet the demands of whatever, like I'm dealing with the variables that the individual's coming in with. Like I can, I can assess that, and we can we can work our way. But you have to have a clear vision of what you're trying to work towards. And if it's a strength pursuit, those are pillars in that direction. Mm. And to take those pillars out is creating something else that is not like commonly shared, known by by people that have gone look, through the experience. You look into any sport uh, that's been around for at least a few decades. And what you'll end up finding in each of these sports are, are, as Justin is saying, pillars. There are certain things that these athletes and coaches have found to be just things you don't want to necessarily uh, take out. Like, you know, uh, like there's a certain type of train, like boxers, right? Why have all the old time boxers and why do the new ones even do long distance running? You think to yourself, what does long distance running have to do with boxing? And or the why do they spend months of training head movement and footwork only? Yeah. You know or why do they hit a speed bag? Yeah. Oh, it's a speed bag. We don't need a speed bag. Or, you know, uh, you know, why do basketball players do some of the drills that they do that are staples? Or, you mm -hmm. know, judo fighters or right. any other athlete? Why? Ha why is there this widespread consensus among? coaches and strength athletes and personal trainers who have a lot of experience, why is there a widespread consensus that those are definitely among some of the most effective general exercises? And it's because there's truth in there. Right. That's why. There's, there's actual truth. And the reason why Eugene's post was controversial is exactly that. Because he said something that is so counter to the yeah. widespread consensus. You know, and 
And that's just it. And it's not always going to be true if, uh, if everybody's doing it. I understand that as well, but well, and the, there's and, a reason why. And, and back to the point that I made with him, I, I also went on, him and I were going back and forth, and I said, I, I think this is, I think the, the, the wrong people are getting the right message from this. And the, and the, and the right or the wrong people are getting the right message from this. And the, then the right message isn't getting across to all the other people that Mm. you want to reach. And I was telling him that because an an example was the the kid who came on there right afterwards and was, you know, challenging me. And I'm like, this is great. This is this young kid who's a, who's a trainer right now, who's going to do, go down the same path that I probably did for the first, you know, five to eight years of training. And that is, you know, I put a client on a squat, and oh my God, it's really hard for them. Like you know, they're they're pronating, their feet, their knees are collapsing, their their chest is falling forward. They can't retract their shoulders enough. Oh, abandon ship. Let's go to the leg press. Oh, now they can, oh look, they could do a leg press. Kurt. Right, must be better. Right, and so and I did I did a lot of uh, I I I don't want to say harm because I don't hurt or injure my clients that way, but I wasn't doing them a favor by moving to movements that were just easier for me to still work the muscles out. Mm-hmm. Well, the better version or the older and more experienced version of me says that, sees that and goes, oh, wow, you know, we have a lot of areas that we need to address and work on. And then I would unpack the squat and began to address the the breakdown in that movement. And that's another thing that makes, that's why those movements are so valuable is they give uh, coaches like ourselves a great starting point of like, okay, this is, this is the pinnacle is to get a good squat or a good deadlift. Now, the reality of it that we all know as coaches, and so does probably Eugene, is that probably a majority of your people that come in can't perform those movements very well. But that doesn't mean that you abandon them and you go look for easier exercises to do to still accomplish the building of the muscle. You still should use that, I, in my opinion, should still use that as foundational movements that we're going to pr- pursue working it to, well, towards. There's a, there's a reason why the squat is a part of most – Maybe not all, but most um, national certification assessments. If you look at a lot of the assessments across these certifications that have been around for a while, a squat or some form of a squat is typically in there because it tells you a lot. Right. It doesn't tell you everything. A, a real good assessment, you, you, there's there's a lot of things, multiple things you want to use and, and look at. But when you do a squat, you can look at a lot of different things and how they're working, not just individually, but how they're working or not working together. Um, I'll, I'll, here, here's a great example. Uh, you, Adam, um, for all intents and purposes, the squat should, uh, using a lot of the arguments against the squat, it would be very easy for you to say you shouldn't squat. You're tall, right. you have long legs, your back hurt uh, when you did squats, and your back hurt, in fact, sometimes when you didn't squat, it right. would just hurt. So you were actually the poster boy for, oh, this guy right here, he's tall, he's lanky, he's you know, it hurts his back. Like he shouldn't be squatting. Now, uh, Adam's a great trainer. He's worked with a lot of people. And so instead, what did he do? He said, well, why can't I squat? And he spent a year working on getting himself to be able to squat. Now that you can squat, the benefits are, I mean, you can see it. Right. You can see it blows everything else away. Right, right. You know? and, that, and that same example same example applies to so many clients that I've trained now, right? It, totally. Again, I the beginning career. And I think that's why I'm, I'm passionate about this argument because I think I was on that side of the fence for the first half of my career. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and when I'm being completely self-aware and honest, uh, why? It was because it was hard. Yeah. Squatting was hard. It's a lot of work. Deadling, deadlifting was hard. I didn't want. I wanted to get a pump. I wanted to look better. I wanted to build muscle. I wanted to burn body fat. That's all I cared about. I didn't want to address why my feet were pronating and my, why my knees were collapsing and why the why my back hurt when I was squatting. Like, fuck that. I didn't want to do that. And so when I read when I read material like this, especially from very intelligent, educated coaches uh, before me that we're presenting it because it's he's not the first person to challenge these movements. I mean, although it's still the consensus that they're they're the superior movements, they've been challenged before by other professionals and and tr- and made cases of other movements being better. Uh, but I disagree because with the message that comes across to a young trainer like myself is, "Oh good, I don't need to do those movements." And so I uh, avoid them and I do all a, bu- a bunch of other exercises and and built an okay physique and if if all you care about is uh, aesthetics and that's the the only goal is how I look, then absolutely you can avoid those movements your entire life and and build muscle and mm. burn body fat without ever doing it. But there, there's so much more carryover uh, that 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 you get from that. Not to mention something that I think we talk about on the show that not a lot of fitness professionals talk about 
is the psychological benefits. Yeah. What are the benefits of f- finding something or uh, trying to get it good at a skill inside the gym and and starting and being bad at it and trying to figure it out and working towards it over months and probably years for a lot of people? What is what is the unsaid value of that? Or the value of the right. carryover? You know, <clears throat> if you could squat well that means you're going to be more functional in everyday life, more so than if you could leg press well or hack squat you know, well. It just has a lot of carryover. We already make things easier in all aspects of life to begin with. That's why a, are we going to do this to, to fitness training? That's another reason why I have a problem with this is, is this generation now. Is this the right message to send to the generation that's coming up right now and learning from all of us that, hey, it's okay if it's, if it's too hard for you. There's other exercises that are better. Like, yeah. I think that's a terrible message. Because yeah, most people who don't squat, go squat, they're going to come back and be like, it's not yeah. for me. It, it's a cop-out <laughs> yeah. to me. It's a cop-out, and it's like conforming to your client's demands versus you as the professional, you know, taking them through the journey and, and, and delivering what's best. Absolutely. And now, along those lines of controversy, since we're talking about controversy. Got me all fired up. Did you guys, <laughs> did you guys see the, uh, uh, the, the autopsy results? From Je- Jeffrey Epstein, I, what I did see was Joe Rogan's jokes that yeah. he's been posting. Duh, dude, I mean, it's just like, come on, guys. So his brother, Jeffrey Epstein, uh, Epstein's brother, hired a uh, an autopsy. Um, what do they call them? Pa- pathology. I don't remember what they're calling me. I'll, I'll pull it up for you. A, oh, a forensic pathologist. Okay. And he is showing evidence that he did not die by suicide. He says that the Autopsy, autopsy points to homicide. To so, strangulation. Strangulation, right? yeah. Somebody yeah. somebody killed him is what he's saying. Yeah, which is funny because <laughs> I mean, obviously right. that's what happened. Now what? Dude, yeah. how- Are you, you going to do something about it or is this just going to be like one of those, yep, it, they got away with Have it. you seen all the memes that people are sharing? Yeah, didn't you see the one that Joe Rogan yeah. posted? Yeah. <laughs> Did you see the one I posted? The pregnancy no. one yeah. where she's yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. That, that was the result. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I posted one too. Yeah. Where there's a bunch of them where there's like a fact in there like- yeah. Like, Epstein did you, was murdered. Yeah, did you know that wild boars can carry, you know, 40 pounds of weight on their back and Jeffrey Epstein did not kill himself? Like, all these memes that are, like, <laughs> informational. And then there'll be, like, a... Like a, like a know, Snapple cap, you know? Yeah, dude. <laughs> and uh, wasn't, didn't Kevin Spacey... So wasn't Kevin Spacey being investigated for, like... Yeah, he, uh, was, on the, he was on the Bill Cosby train, right? It yeah, was something down the same Whoa. path. There right? was something that happened with him. Like he, I don't he was get on that train. They, they were invested, and it was connected. Why not? They get off. I mean, these guys <laughs> un- unbelievable, dude. Yeah, they get I off mean, and then they get off again. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, uh, not aware. You, I like you to can get off. you can rape seventy two women, just not seventy three. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's, terrible. it's crazy yeah, yeah, yeah. and serve two years or whatever. Well, he got. What is Kevin going to serve? So Kev, so check this out. So they brought him in, and a, and he's connected to Epstein. Yeah. So they're saying that he's connected. He was fly. He was on his flights. You know, to this island that Epstein have that everybody said was like where he did all this terrible shit or whatever. Anyway, the main, uh, I guess, witness or the person who was, you know, had all the evidence against Spacey died. Oh, so Spacey's out. Oh. He's off. Bro. Conveniently. Interesting. <laughs> this whole thing is crazy to me. <laughs> what is happening? What the fuck did he Did on? he uh, commit suicide like Epstein? I don't know. Yeah, he, uh. yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> he ran himself over with a car or something like that. <laughs> yeah. 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 This whole thing is insane, oh, man. Oh, my God. It's so dude. crazy. It's so crazy. Anyway, and then yeah. again, more controversy. Uh, the podcast I did with Max that I told you guys about. Yeah. The yeah. Genius Life podcast. Right. That one came out, so I'm waiting for a little bit of blowback. Why would, would you well, say? Yeah, what was we, so controversial? Well, about we it? talked about Game Changers, the documentary. Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, you know, that's really stirring up a lot of so so you know that James Cameron um invested like hundred and forty million dollars into a vegan a protein brand powder. new vegan protein powder. Yeah, yeah. or pro, or supplement or company. Supplement company. He bought he it's actually right now the largest vegan supplement company in the US, now owned by or, or he's one of the main shareholders is, wow. is James Cameron. Wow. And we I knew it. Remember, we called this. We said, I bet you they're going to be, they're putting out this documentary, and then on the heels of it, they're going to follow along I with it. I hope that if, you, if you're a- Is it called Zahelu? If I hope if our <laughs> our our audience be awesome. hears this episode, and, and when people like Kai Green, who I, we, who I think are setting the table for announcing that they're sponsored oh, by Oh, Kai Green's so on the road. I hope a ton of people go over there and call him out on it, because it's I think that's what's coming next, is he's been doing- Vegan post yeah. after vegan post, and it's like uh, some people though are saying that he's trolling. So I don't, I don't follow 
Kai. Like who's trolling? Oh, that Kai is? Yeah, that Kai is tr- uh, trolling everybody. Maybe. Yeah. You know, I mean, if he did, he got me. He seems to be going deep in it, though. It's like every post he's talking about it. I, I agree, too. Yeah. So he, he he might be. Look, I, I mean, I got nothing wrong with, uh, I mean, organ- all plant based games. I'll, I'll tell you what, Organifi is a vegan uh, supplement company. It's the best one that I'm aware of. Um, you know, so when I direct people, and I take, if I take protein, I take vegan protein. And that's because I have an intolerance to, uh, to dairy protein. So I can't do whey, I can't do casein. Um, I could do a beef protein powder, but I haven't had. I never tried one of those. That was good. They're usually beef powder. Doesn't sound too. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, how the hell they, have a, they have an egg one too. I remember taking that. It was like J. Robs or something. But. Oh, egg protein. Yeah, egg, egg white. Protein. Yeah, yeah, that's like, like fart city. Exactly. Man. My, <laughs> it was horrible. My favorite is when we get on these pages and we talk to people about that, and they try and throw that back in our face. I'm like, we're sponsored by a fucking vegan protein. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're not now, anti-vegan. Dude. It's just oh, funny I, that. <laughs> no, I'm just. I'm, we're anti-bad. I'm infor- plant-based and meat-based. Yeah. yeah. What? We're, what are we gonna do? We're totally anti-bad information, and so Max and I got on there and really kind of broke down some of the fallacies of that documentary and and you know my favorite was the study they showed on game changers that showed that the look at this the, a vegan diet will cause better performance in athletes because they were comparing a freaking keto diet to one with carbs which is just yeah it's like yes it's true if you don't eat carbs and you eat carbs you're going to perform better but that doesn't mean vegan is not, is is better yeah. uh it, that wasn't comparing you know the, the omnivore diet to a vegan diet that was comparing a no carb diet to a car- diet with carbs. Right. So yeah. they took some science and they twisted it. A lot of sleight of hand stuff in there. Totally. Yeah, totally. No, but no. well made. No, it was. Well, I, I really think I think they had a, some political strategic. They got one of the better filmmakers out there to, to produce it, that's for sure. Yeah, dude. So yeah. I don't know, man. We'll see. We'll yeah. see what happens on that. But I'm waiting for the backlash. But I, I love Max. He's a smart dude. He's very measured. Yeah. You know, he does a good job and, and he's he's not uh you know, he's not biased. He's always trying to do you know, go off of the science and what actually works, and um, and I really appreciate that. That's why him. I can't imagine him getting too much blowback. I mean, he's a pretty measured. He guy. said he is. He still yeah. gets a lot of bro. He gets really? a lot of shit. Yeah, he, he says does. he's been getting That's so weird. Man. He well, says he's, that he's been getting attacked by or or a lot of vegans are are are, are hitting him uh, hard because he's saying that an omnivore diet is better for most people, which is what the evidence totally yeah. shows. You yeah. know. So, Some people just don't want to recognize uh, science, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess. Like, yeah. And, and also, I this is the first time I've ever seen a diet be politicized um, and being tied to uh, morality, not just the not killing animals part, but it's better for the environment, it's better for the world. And so because it's politicized, it's kind of drawing a law, line in the sand. Yeah. Like, like diets have been uh, tribal forever. You know, people have always been tribal about their diet, but never have I – like. Is it going to be like you're going to be eating, you know, a burger and people are going to think you're like, you know, you know, lighting, you know, uh, oil on fire or something like that, like the same right. thing, or smoking a cigarette, right? Th- throw yeah. blood on you. Yeah. Hey, know, did man. you guys get uh, which one of you guys got the DM uh, from the guy who works at 24 Hour Fitness? I did. Oh, I saw that, that was you. I did. Wow. Yeah. Huh? So I guess so they're downsizing a bit. I guess all the clubs. This is what he said. So this is from this is from uh, somebody who works there. So I don't know if this is true. But I guess he said that all the clubs except for the super sport ones are no longer 24 hour. Hmm. How do you call yourself 24 hour fitness? Yeah, and you got 24 I hours. I know. Isn't that funny? There's going to be fitness. Yeah. Lim- limited hour fitness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 20, 20 hour fitness. So I guess they're going to change their hours. So obviously cutting costs. He's cutting back kids club, I thought I saw. Cutting back kids club. They're just doing more rounds of, of, of costs. The bean counters are, are definitely taking over again, huh? They are, dude. Yeah. That company, man. It's what do you think? Do you think that eventually they go to like a fully automated, like almost like uh, what's that? What's that company that grew? Uh, the, oh yeah, what's not the, Snap Fitness. What, no, no, no. Uh, I almost did Anytime Fitness. Anytime yeah, yeah, Fitness, yeah, yeah, yeah. where it's just like you, a card and you swipe. You, it, it takes three people to manage the whole place. I kind of like that model. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, it's my, it might be the direction they're going. Yeah, I mean they've already they already have established a name for themselves. They already have enough facilities in place enough branding in place that you know they could just be chopping 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 there was a while there where their yeah. I, their goal was and this was under master under mark where their goal was to become known as a good um a good gym that is also priced uh, competitively like they they don't want to be the, the bottom you know what i mean it feels like they're racing to the bottom like no we just want to be cheap we just want to have well, more when, gyms and be cheap. Well, I remember when they when they sold and then Carl Liebert came in as CEO. He came originally from uh, Home Depot and he was responsible. He was the CEO of Home Depot when Home Depot created all the self-checkout. 
So that was like his main initiative when he came in was to automate more, to cut, cut, cut people that didn't need to be there and automate and move this gym into the future uh, with no regard to what it takes to get somebody involved into a fitness journey. You know, it's just a different monster. You go to Home Depot because you need a hammer and nails. And you, if I, when I show up there, mm-hmm. I don't need someone to convince me oh, I need a hammer and nail. I, sh- I came there because I need a hammer and nail or else I wouldn't even be in there. I don't browse right. the store. I didn't need to get convinced to go into the store. So it's a total different model than somebody who is on the fence of, you know, should I work out? Do I need to get in shape? Or my doctor just told me I'm unhealthy and so I need to do something about it, but I'm here. I don't yeah. know what to do. When you go to a gym, you don't buy anything. Yeah. Now that's the thing. It's a dream. Yeah, yep. You really have to like paint that picture for people. Yeah, and I think that they forgot that what they thought was we're going to lower the cost of operating the company by cutting out personnel or cutting out that, that human touch. And then they assumed that the revenue coming in would stay the same. Yeah, they didn't realize that that would affect. We knew this as as, as gym managers. I walked into a gym, and the first month would increase the revenue by twenty to fifty percent. Sometimes, how the fuck did I do that? Just walking into the gym. That's the kind of an impact that the people in the gym have. And CrossFit proved this. Mm-hmm. CrossFit proved this. It became popular. Not because of their gyms. Their gyms were fucking warehouses. They were dirt yeah. holes. Yeah. But why? It wasn't the amenities. Why yeah. did they blow up? Because it was about the people and the community and, and the environment yeah. in there. That's what makes a gym a gym. It's not right. the equipment. Nobody gives a shit. People don't know about equipment. They, yeah, they care want less. that accountability. They want to know that people are there in their corner. That's it. Yeah. And that's what creates, you guys know that as well as I. I can walk into a gym that has minimal equipment. But you feel the energy. You see the people in there and what's going oh, on. Yeah. And you know, like oh, the part is- that I find interesting, interesting in watching it is, you know, can you though have grown to be so big and you have so much uh, of a base already that you can look at your your you know overhead and go, oh wow, we're spending, you know, let's just say for argument's sake, we're 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 making a hundred million dollars a year and we're spending fifty million on people to run this facility. Could we cut the cost of fifty million people or fifty million dollars on people down to ten million dollars in people and afford to lose the forty million in memberships? Because there's still a certain amount of people that sure. will pay just because it's absolutely convenient. Because it's uh, a gym. Well, it was a gym open twenty four hours. Uh, it has you know a, a lot of them have saunas and 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 pools and basketball courts and cardio and decent sized weight floors and there's one on almost every corner like McDonald's these days. So uh, you know you or I don't need to be sold to go in there. We just want. I, I mean, I still pay my 24 hour membership because I know when we travel and we go around places, I can pretty much count on. That there's a 24 around. I can't yeah, count right. on that there's a bay club o- over there. Yeah, that's I can't a completely count. different mentality towards it. Right. So so wh- why I don't count them out completely, although I, I don't think you could ever build a business or build, uh, build a gym business with the mentality that they have now. I agree with you yeah. that- you know, But do they have enough to where- Right. Enough do they, steam- Do you have enough just- clout that you, it's okay, we can, we can lose 40 million because we're going to cut 50 million- and, and people maybe, and overhead. Maybe, maybe, but the gym business is far more competitive today than it was 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. You have companies like LA Fitness and you know Crunch. Planet Fitness is what's Planet Fitness and all these other companies that are competing now. Well, I think that's why they're doing this because Planet Fitness is, is at the bottom yeah. as far as pricing. Nine dollars a month or ten dollars a month, and they're everywhere. Yeah, and they're starting to pop up everywhere. So I, that's I actually think that twenty four looks at them as probably one of their their biggest competitor, and they are trying to figure out how do we get our rates down to nine dollars and and stay afloat. And the maybe the only obvious choice of that is cutting overhead, cutting the the kids club out, cutting the the employees that are working from ten p.m. till. 4 a.m. because there's not really a lot of traffic in there and getting rid of positions and... Well, you know, the way that... Um, and I th- I'm pretty sure that Ray Wilson had comp plans like this for his managers. Now, Ray Wilson owned... He's the... If if Mark Mastroff is the godfather of the fitness industry, Ray Wilson would be like the grandfather. He's like one of the first people to really kind of start to figure this out 
And this is back when 24-Hour Nautilus combined with uh, Family Fitness Centers, which was owned by Ray Wilson, became 24-Hour Fitness. But anyways, Ray Wilson had comp plans where the managers were given a budget and whatever they saved over the budget, they, they took. And that proved to be a great model for cutting cost because here's my belief. I think... There's definitely ways you can cut costs from the top when you have a massive company where you can cut it from the top, but you're never going to be quite as accurate at cutting costs or as effective as the people individually who are managing each gym because each gym is a little bit different. Like I may be managing a gym and I know what my budget is. Let's say my budget's $50,000 a month and I'm looking at my club and I'm like, I don't need all this, these people cleaning my club. My club is clean. We clean the club. I can cut a lot of that. Or I may be in a, be in a club like, man, this club is dirty all the time. Mm-hmm. I need more money on that. And I actually need less money on kids club because barely any of my members use this. And so this is what they did. The managers cut where they saw they needed to cut, added where they needed, and then the rest they would take. And sometimes that meant that they just worked more themselves, but the profits did well and they still perform very well. Now, Cutting from the top can be very difficult. Now, the, the challenge with that is that, you know, 24 has already made the mistake of cutting the cost of or cutting the pay of these general managers. Oh, they got a lot of the best ones out. Yeah, so yeah. somebody who could who probably managed P&Ls really well like that, you know, back in Ray Wilson days is long gone and now mm-hmm. you're attracting mm-hmm. a different breed of managers that that come in. So, yeah. You know, you you think that would be a good idea how to do it, but it might be too little too late uh, in you know, that direction. You know what I would love? I would love to ask Master off what would he do yeah. if he got twenty four hour fitness That'd again? Be an interesting conversation. Yeah, who knows? Maybe they're maybe they're pri- maybe yeah. they're positioning because sometimes what companies do to position yeah them, position to sell that's what they do they yeah. cut costs and they're, they're one ready of the, to one, sell. Of, one of the best ways to show that you're profitable when you're that size is exactly what I said is yeah it's uh, easy we're spending yeah fifty million dollars a year on people cut get costs, ri- get rid yeah. of all those people if the place is still up can, your value if that place can still stand you, yeah. you know and it may be a recipe for long term disaster but it, an investor may not understand that or see that yeah they they're just, just looking see, at the, oh shit yeah, you profited a hundred million at the numbers mm-hmm. and they're, they're mm-hmm. handed that yeah have you guys seen the the Silicon Valley uh, that that's back like oh, the, new the series out? no yeah. i haven't oh my god it's I love so that great it's such it's such great satire on what's all around us all the time it's great because they like huli gets gets bought out by amazon and they're going through this whole thing and uh it's just so great they throw so many jabs at a lot of these like massive companies like the four horsemen companies Mm -hmm. and they're talking about them basically being the new kings and everything and then they need to take them down and so they're like resisting like this king taking them over and then uh you know they're going into congress and kind of like battling the fact of like stealing all the users' data, and these are all like real issues no, that we're all seeing. My, all my clients that are involved, uh, clients and friends that are, are working for a lot of these companies, say that that it's so spot. Is on. it on point? It it's nails so spot it, on, dude. Yeah. Oh wow, yeah. I want, I want, and is this Showtime or HBO? It's HBO. Okay. I can, oh, I got, you've never seen it before? No, I've got HBO now. You so. kind of have to watch it from the very beginning. I was going to say, series. does it make sense to watch it from the no, beginning? No, no, watch from the beginning for sure. Yeah. Really? It's worth it. It's hilarious. That's right. why, like, Courtney gets, like, uncomfortable because the guy is, like, so awkward. You know, he, he's, like, has the most awkward delivery. And it, I, I love it because it's so funny. Well, it's, again, that's another point that they, they say that this they, a lot of my, my family and friends and, and clients that are involved in that space are, like, that's, like, those little incubators, yeah. the personalities. Those are the CEOs. Yeah, yeah. The, those They're, are the personality. Hyper nerds that yes. like, hate, like, attention. Yeah. Like, ah, ah. So they, <laughs> yeah. That's the voice you make when you make fun of me, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> hey, on today's episode, uh, yeah. Dick. yeah, I'm always getting bullied. Sorry. Oh shit! <laughs> All right, our first question is from D. Prinvale. What are the differences between a beginner, intermediate, or advanced lifter? Now, th- at first glance, this question seems pretty simple. But the more I think about it, the more I realize it's that hard. that's hard to answer. It is right. Like I would say, a beginner is is somebody who is learning how to move properly and learning how to uh, you know, do the right exercises for their body properly. Intermediate is somebody that knows those things. They know how to do the squats and the deadlifts and the, the presses and the rows. They've got good form. They know what the exercises do for their body. I think most people 
stay in intermediate for a long time. I think intermediate I was, is a long phase. I was just going to say, I, I feel like I could answer this really well for beginner and advanced. I have a hard time putting in uh, putting together the category that would fit all the intermediate people. And what I mean by that is a beginner to me is somebody who is, it's, uh, they're very green to the gym. Most exercises are very foreign. Uh, most of their mechanics are, are poor. And so they're, they're, they're still learning the technique and what is it for? That's kind of like your beginner. And then somebody who's on the advanced to me is, is somebody who can intuitively lift. They're, yes. a be- yeah. they are, they understand form. They understand exercise. They understand programming. They know what their body needs to get to whatever goals I they have. I think it just amounts to consistency. Like it, it, you know, like if you're an advanced lifter, it, you've put, you've gotten past the point of like having those waves of momentum where it's like I'm on, I'm off, I'm on, I'm off. Like you know, you know what to do in the gym for the most part. If you're, you know, intermediate, like you know the mechanics, you know how to kind of structure your workouts. But maybe you haven't fine tuned it, you know, to the, to the degree, and maybe that's just because of the consistency, the frequency that you've been, you know, uh, applying these techniques, and you haven't really been succumbed by like, well, I don't feel like, you know, going for a few weeks to months, and then you come back, and it's like this 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 on and off kind no, of thing. I, I think I think advanced takes a long time to get to. I really do. I think it's. Advanced lifters. Well, it's probably like every, anything else that we talk about being a master at, yeah, right? Exactly. Ten thousand hours. Yeah, an advanced yeah. lifter is somebody who can go by feel. So it's like you know, it's like like a black belt in a martial art. Like you you know when a movement is working for you, when it's not. You know when you need to apply more intensity or less. You know how frequency affects your body. Um, you are uh, in the unconscious competent stage where. You don't. It's like walking or breathing. Like I don't need to think about walking or breathing. It just happens. I take one step after the other, and I can talk to other people and think about other things, and it's normal. And it, that's what advanced lifting is all about. And advanced lifting, if that's the definition, it takes a long time. That's why I think most people are intermediate. Like in the yeah. past, I would have said, oh, you know, after about three years of consistent lifting, you're advanced. I, I think I change that now. I think you could lift consistently, and it might take you longer. It might take more like five years or six years before you really get to that that place of really understanding how your body feels uh, when you I imagine it. I, I really like the 10,000-hour rule, and, 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 and it applies to most other things. I don't know why it wouldn't apply very well to this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I felt like it's, it took me 10,000 hours to get good at being a personal trainer. I think it for sure took me 10,000 hours of training myself and others before I it became intuitive for me. Isn't that funny, too? Sure. Because if you if I went and asked, you know, Justin, Adam, or Sal, uh, five years into personal training. Do you think you're a yeah a master personal trainer? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, I'm an I'm, I'm awesome. Now looking back, I was far from master at five years. It right took it. me more like ten. I would say it took ten years before I, I felt I, like I, I was. I, I like what you said. I think I think most people in in their first year or so um, fall in the beginner category at least, like for the, at least the first year. And and then after that, once you you know get pretty good form down and understand the exercises that you're doing, you probably move into the beginning stages of intermediate, and then you're probably in intermediate for most of your lifting career until you've put that many hours under your belt. And just what comes with that experience uh, is a lot of things that you learn along the way, and you probably are in that intermediate phase thinking you're advanced, a lot like what if you would have asked me five years into personal training and seven years into training myself. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know it. I know it. I, everything I need to, but I, shit, looking back now, I go like, yeah. I, most of what I think I've learned came from years 10 and beyond. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it's... Well, uh, then, sure, but then what about those those people at the gym that have been there for like 20 years doing the same routine? You're stuck in intermediate. Yeah. yeah. You're, yeah. Stuck, you're stuck in intermediate. That's yeah, a great... It, that's, it's not the hours... You know, it's the education. It's the right it. hours. Yeah. It's, yeah. What do they say? Perfect practice makes perfect, not just practice. You know, yeah. I think that's a great point. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean that if you've been lifting for four years because you're not advanced, that doesn't mean you can't do an advanced programmed workout. Right. Because then there's recovery ability. There's your body's ability to adapt. Now, that's totally different. Totally, totally different. If you've been training consistently hard for two years, three years, you could follow an advanced workout. The oh, problem a, is you can't write of an advanced workout. <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, you can yeah. follow one. Yeah. You, yeah. If, if, you, if you bought an advanced workout program and you've been lifting consistently for two or three years and you've got good and you're healthy, otherwise 
that's probably going to be okay for you. You're just not going to be able to create one for yourself. That's You're definitely good, not going to be able to create one for other people. That's a good point because it, yeah. within be, beginner, intermediate, advanced, there's different subcategories of what we're talking about. Right. right? Yeah. And, and if you're just talking about... Uh, like the, your body's ability. Yeah, to- your body's ability to train advanced lifts or to train an advanced program. If you've been lifting consistently for a year or two, you absolutely can train a... Uh, I mean, it's like the powerlifting program we have right now. Like, I wouldn't recommend it to a, a, a beginner green first month in the gym. No, I would tell them to run like no. a MAPS anabolic and go through the three, the, the three core ones that we originally created first. That's almost a year's worth of training. Then you would be, I think, in a great place to to do something, move into that. But uh, yeah, I think the beginner, uh, intermediate, advanced really depends on what we're talking about. Next question is from Leah V, nineteen eighty three. Can you break down the differences between the overhead press versus push press? Which is better for the novice lifter? Excellent. So um, overhead press is just a straight press the bar or dumbbells up straight up over your head. And it's strict in the sense that your body stays tight and rigid when you do it. You've got good control, good stability. A push press is explosive. So a push press is I got the bar or the dumbbells at my shoulders, and you're then I engine your hips back, and you're explosively kind of jumping the weight up. Yeah, I'm boosting it. I'm boosting it with my lower body and my chest, or my yeah. the rest of my body to definitely to get more the bar. advanced, yes. way more advanced. Uh, the novice lifter shouldn't be doing a push press. A push press requires all the skills that it takes to be good at an overhead press plus extra. So if you're not like advanced, if you don't haven't like mastered the overhead press, doing a push press. Is totally silly. Now they do have different benefits. Um, the push press is explosive, so there's a speed element um, that's excellent for people who've been working out for a little while. So if you've only ever done overhead presses, try some push presses and watch what happens to the muscle on your body. It's also excellent for people that have athletic pursuits, right? Like if you care about explosiveness and that matters to you. For the general population right. that's just trying to build muscle, lose body fat it's probably less applicable than somebody who's like an athlete. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm someone who's a young athlete and, I, and explosiveness is something that I, I, I want, then there's there's a little more value to that. Uh, but still, regardless, I, I would teach a strict overhead press and, and great form there before yeah. I start to incorporate. A strict press is definitely a prerequisite for me. I mean, you, I would need to see how well – that you're controlled and that you're able to stabilize the weight overhead. That by itself – is quite the challenge with today's demands uh, in the workplace, at home, like what you're doing constantly, just to be able to raise your arms and have good shoulder mobility right. by itself is is quite the feat. And I think that a lot of people don't realize that. They they think that by just lifting something over their head, like that's, you know, the end of the story uh, where we, we don't even like track to see uh, like where that bar path is, like where your, where your capacity is to bring your, your shoulder in the right position to be able to now uh, in- incorporate your shoulder blades to stabilize and get your muscles activated uh, properly. It, so there's just a lot going on there before we get into going fast. This is why I love the Z press. Yes, I think it forces it's, that. Yes, it forces that. Like it's showing somebody on a on a you know our program in a video a strict press is is tough because I know from my experience you know I could stand in front of a client show them a strict overhead press then give them the bar and them do it and then then fuck up the bar path easily because their body will deviate and they'll just mm-hmm. they'll take the easiest path that's just just natural for clients so I love teaching with the Z press because what I know about the Z press is you can't cheat it you'll fall back mm-hmm. And so if you have a poor bar path, uh, you'll you'll know right away. There's no guessing for you. You don't need a mirror to know. You won't be able to extend your arms all the way up and and lock out with the bar above your head and not fall over unless you pr- are taking a good bar path. So I love to teach the Z press uh, first and get the, those mechanics down really well. And then I teach a strict uh, overhead press standing where I teach them to engage their core, activate their glutes, and keep their, their lower body stiff. And then the advance to that is the, eventually the push press. Totally. And I, I this, you know, when I first became a trainer, this blew me away quite a bit. Um, when I had the average 35 plus year old, so 35 and up, come in who's untrained, uh, just the average person who doesn't work out, I was shocked at how little of them or how few of them were able to fully extend their arm above their head without weight. It sounds simple. Sounds like nothing. 
But if you're listening right now, go to your mom or your dad or your aunt or your uncle, somebody who doesn't work out, have them place their back up against the wall and see if they can raise their arms straight up above their head while keeping their hand and elbow in contact with the wall without having to overarch their back or have their butt come off the wall. You'd be surprised how how few people can ha- can achieve that straight line above their head. When I would train people in advanced age, that was something that I always worked on. And it, was, it always blew me away. I was like, wow, you can't even reach straight up above your head. But it makes sense. How often do we do that mm-hmm. in our everyday lives? Uh, to, you know, how often do we strengthen that, that pattern? We don't. Um, I mean, I lost a lot of that. It took me a long time to get that back. Right. Because, and, and I was still working my shoulders. This goes back to the earlier discussion in the, the big three kind of, because I would actually incorporate the big four and it would be overhead yeah, press. Totally. I would too. In yeah. fact, functionally speaking, I would even consider it superior to a, a bench, bench press. press. I agree. So, I, I mean, and this is just another example that, I mean, I did, um, you know, military press and lateral raises and front dumbbell raises. I did all those movements and built great shoulders uh, for a decade of, of training and then got to a point where, you know, and I, I totally ignored overhead press. Why? Because I'd arched my low back. I didn't have good thoracic mobility, so it didn't allow me to retract my shoulders so I could get my shoulder or my arms up by my ears. And so I just kept building muscle and neglected that movement. And because of it, have all kinds of uh, poor mechanics. And it took me a, probably a year on unpacking that and working on that to get to the point where I could actually do a behind the neck press. But you know, talk about the value in that. I mean, all uh, I had a lot of neck pain and, and tightness in my traps all the time. That got eliminated mm-hmm. completely. The tracking, uh, just at my shoulder, just the whole, uh, you know, the, the way you I would feel the clicking on my shoulder when I did certain exercises because my, my scapula was rolled forward, uh, completely got rid of that. I mean, this just goes, this is why these movements are so good. And a lot of people are bad at them, but that's not why you should ignore them you, you incorporate them. If they do bother you, they are challenging. Then instead of just walking away from them, you try and unpack that, which this is where why I think that Prime Pro is probably the most valuable thing for everybody because very few people are going to do the big three or the big four and have perfect mechanics. And it's because they've got breakdown in one of the major joints, mm-hmm. if not all of them or most of them. And they should be doing movements. And it's to not completely obvious. Right. You know, you really need feedback. And a lot of times, like, you can get that from a coach that's so going to be able to point that out and look at you. But if you're just by yourself doing an exercise, you think everything's going great. Yeah. Because that's what your body is, is supposed to do. It's supposed to make it efficient and get to an end point. Like, I'm, I'm doing this. Now I'm getting to an end point. But you don't realize like all these compensations that are occurring along the process. Dude, back in back in the day, uh, you know, bench press didn't become a popular exercise until the nineteen, I'd say, thirty forties. I think um, it was always overhead press. All the strength athletes. If you, you know, nowadays maybe nowadays it's a little different. But when I was growing up, it was like, how much can you bench? That was your, it was your, you know, how they talked about how strong you are. How come? How much can you bench? Now it's maybe how much can you that deadlift, totally squat. Me. <laughs> but yeah, how much you uh, bench, bro? Exactly. Um, no, back in the day, it was how much you could press over your head. That's how much that was a, a test of your strength, and that's why I make the argument that the overhead. And the truth is, you know, I uh, if someone can press a shit ton of weight overhead standing, it means more than if they could bench more off their chest. The overhead press is a very valuable exercise. Yep. Next question is from Jazz Fitness. What are your opinions on training a muscle group that is still sore from the previous workout? Boy, mm. I'll tell you what. So Jazz. Years ago, um, I was uh, my family and I were planning a trip to Italy you know, over the summer. And I wanted to look good because I have a bunch of cousins and family over there. And, I, and they all knew I was in fitness. So I wanted to make a good impression or whatever. I hadn't seen them for a long time. Yeah, hot cousins. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not stuff. that Sicilian. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, you know, so, and I'm, I've always been a historian when it comes to, to fitness, especially bodybuilding. I love reading old publications and stuff. And, you know, at this point, I'd been working out for a long time. And I'd noticed that the bodybuilders and strength athletes in the past, all work their body parts more than once a week. It, it, the, the once a week training became a trend of each, each body part where you like biceps on Monday, you don't wait till next Monday to hit it again. That didn't become a thing until like the 90s. That was because the Mr. Olympia at the time, Dorian Yates, was a an advocate for 
you know, the Arthur Jones style of heavy duty training where you hammer the shit out of a muscle and leave it alone for an entire week. But before that, everybody trained muscle groups twice a week. And before that, it was three days a week or four days a week. So I'd read all these things and I was like, you know, I know I'm only supposed to work my body parts once a week, but I'm going to try this two day a week thing. And so what I did is I broke up my, my body into, uh, you know, I did upper body, lower body, rest, upper body, lower body. And part of my rationale was I got to get lean anyway. So I'm just going to burn a lot more calories. I'm doing, I'm hitting everything more. So I'm just going to burn more calories. Now, luckily, intuitively, I knew to not go quite as hard if my body was a little sore. So what ended up happening, Monday, I hit upper body, you know, Tuesday legs, Wednesday off. Then I came back Tuesday, it's upper body again. I'm still a little sore. I'm going to go a little easy, um, but I'm still going to train it because I got to see what happens. Blew my mind. Training a sore muscle appropriately, so don't beat the shit out of it, but training it appropriately, I recovered faster. Actually, I didn't get more sore the next day. I actually felt a little bit better. And then I started progressing at a very, very quick rate. And this was the one of the things that led to the development of MAPS Anabolic, which is where you hit body parts essentially three days a week. So hitting a sore muscle group, if you do it right, it's actually better than not hitting it. In my oh opinion. yeah, I've had I've had that experience, and it's just like promoting more blood flow, like getting the oxygen there, like all these different, like again, this is dose dependent. This is making sure that I'm not going too intense, uh, you know, with that workout where I'm already sore, but to get through like those same movements and get blood flow and get that uh, to, to facilitate better recovery. Definitely. Uh, that definitely was an effective strategy and that helped a lot because like uh, just sitting around and being sore, like I, I noticeably was more stiff and, and it, it would almost exaggerate it, uh, on that level. I think it's important though. And I agree with everything we're saying, but I also think it's important to, to note that if you, if you're getting so sore, that like you go into it's, it's two three days later and you're hitting that muscle group again or you're supposed to hit that muscle group again and you're like really really sore that's a sign that you you overreached on the last workout and you need to take that into consideration when you go back into that 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 routine again great point that i didn't need to go that far you yeah. know and 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 really you're what you're reaching for or what you're targeting the goal for me is always and i say this a million times on the show that i'm trying to do as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change. Well, what does that look like? Well, what it looks like is just stretching myself enough that I might be a little sore from it. So I know that like, okay, definitely that was uh, a, that was more for me because my body is telling me I'm a little sore from it. But if I'm really sore from it, that means I way overreached and I way over it more, so bad that it, it's probably going to hinder that workout that I do again in two or three days that I probably won't be able to get after it as much as I'd like to because I am so sore. So, yes, I agree. You can definitely hit a muscle, and you should because it will. It'll facilitate recovery faster, and you can you will probably adapt and grow. You're increasing your volume, so there's nothing wrong with training a quote unquote sore yeah. muscle. But I also think that's a good signal for you to know that you're you're overreaching more than you need to, and to probably back off a little bit on on the volume, meaning less sets less reps or a little less weight the next time you circle back around there I, again i'm i'm shoot my my sweet spot if i know that i'm hitting a muscle group every other day or every two days i i want to feel it i, I want to get a good workout where i'm like oh the next day I, I know i worked my legs but when i'm having a hard time walking around i know that it's like oh i totally could have done three less sets and still sent a signal to my body to build muscle mm. there, and I I wouldn't be walking around like I had a stick up my ass, and I'd be able to get a good workout in two days. This is why I've also like I've I, I love I've gravitated more towards the total body workout instead of split. Like I I used to do split routines like a long time ago, but that that was way more. Uh, I, I would get sore from that way more so than I would these total body movements. And that's just mainly because I'm hitting them again. I know I, I'm, I'm going to go through these movements again the next day. And then you, it, it's, it psychologically kind of prepares you to not overreach because you, you already know that like, well, I can't like, I can't really go all out. I have to come back again and in like two days. hit them again. Yeah. So. In two days I'm doing, you know, today yeah. I'm doing squats and you know, man, I feel great. And I've already knocked out five or six sets. Like, oh, maybe I'll push eight or ten sets. But then I'm like, 
well, yeah, I could push eight or 10 sets, but I also know on Wednesday, yeah, you'll I'm, get to it. I'm coming back here again and I'm doing Bulgarian split squats or I'm doing lunges or I'm doing front squats. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to hinder those because I went, I went so hard here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave a little bit in the tank and then know I'm going to get after it on, on two days yeah, later. And also understand that recovery and adaptation are two different things. So your body wanting to heal and your body wanting to build muscle, which is a type of adaptation. Those are two different things. Now, they happen oftentimes at the same time because as your body's healing, it's also trying to build muscle. But that doesn't mean you can't sit, get your body to want to build more muscle while you're healing. In other words, if you're sore and you hit the muscle again, but you do it right, okay, you got to adjust the intensity. Don't overdo it. Depends how sore you are. If I'm super sore, I'm going light. I'm just trying to get a pump. I'm getting a squeeze. I'm stretching a little bit. You're going to send another or a louder or, or make the concurrent muscle building signal louder while not hampering your body's ability to heal. In fact, as we discussed earlier, you may actually speed up your body's ability to heal at the same time. Next question is from Riley McFadder, 18. Thoughts? <laughs> On My processed kind of versus non-processed foods, if the macros are still good in the processed foods. But, I, I, as we go to answer this, Doug, will you look this up? Because I know I'm going to make a point that I want to make sure I'm, I'm right on my percentages because I've it's been a while since I looked this. Would you look up uh, at what FDA approves uh, labels to be off? And I believe like it's how accurate do they have to be? Yeah, I believe FDA a, a allows like thirty like percent. Oh yeah, 30. yeah, it's twenty to thirty percent wiggle room on their labels and you would be a fool to think that that's a it, lot yeah you'd be a fool to think that a a, <laughs> a, a uh, package thing like a lean pocket which is designed to market and advertise to people that are probably trying to lose weight or count their calories uh it, but they also want it still to taste good you you would be a fool to think that they're not going to push those boundaries as far as they can so that you feel like man this is so good i can't believe it's only 250 calories well it technically could be about 320 calories based off of how much they allow it to be off and then also foods that are marketing to oh this has 20 grams of protein well again if you can be off 20 or 30 percent i know i'm targeting the group demographic of people that are searching for protein i'm going to push those limits i'm going to round up to make you think that there's a lot more in there so before Sal goes on his tangent about processed and non-processed foods and the benefits of, of each or whatever, I'm just going to tell you straight up that when you're trying, this is also why 99.9% .9 of all competitors don't eat processed foods when you're competing is because when you are have to be that diligent and track. You can't count on it. No, you can't. You can't count on it. I can't, I can't go eat it. Open it's something. much more precise to weigh a chicken breast or weigh. Yes. Yeah. Way, way, way more accurate. And when I'm controlling everything that's, that's in it and being cooked in, and that, this goes for when you go to restaurants too, and they, and they now have, uh, have to like label or list, you know, and, and to me, it's mm -hmm. so funny that this is even a question because, do you really think yeah. that the 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 thousand chipotles that have uh, ten thousand different employees that are that are yeah. scooping the black beans and the rice? And oh, the I know who my heavy handed guy yeah, is. Right? There's, I, I'm like, there's, hey man, you give me the meat. Right? Do you really think that that they're all the same? No, you're talking about, and we're talking about hundreds of calories that could be off uh, based off of just one meal. Uh, and if you eat multiple meals out or that are processed. Uh, yeah, you, you're. It's mm. nowhere near as accurate as you think it is. So here's what I'm going to say about uh, about this topic. I I can pretty confidently say, and I think that this will age very very well. So I think in 10, 15 years, I think this uh, this is going to be the consensus. But I can confidently say that it was the processed food revolution that was the single largest contributor to the obesity epidemic in modern Western societies. For a long time, we wanted to blame um, uh, we wanted to blame fat. It was too much fat in our diet. That's what's making it fat, making us fat. Then it was carbs or sugar. The reality is, you can gain or lose weight uh, if your calories are too high or too low, and it can be higher in carbs, lower in carbs, higher in fat, lower in fat. We know this. So why the hell? Ever since I'd say the 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 fifties, but definitely the sixties, seventies, and it really started taking off after the seventies, eighties, nineties, and now. Why the hell did we all of a sudden become so fat? And why is it that other countries that start to adopt the quote unquote American diet, which really isn't it's just really it's a 
It's the modern, uh, developed Western diet. Why is it that other countries, as soon as they adopt this, they all get fat too? You look at Mexico, for example. Mexico, uh, you know, a few decades ago, three, four decades ago, did not have an obesity problem. Yeah. You go back 50 years, they had a problem the opposite. Today, Mexico, I believe, rivals America in terms of obesity. Um, how did this happen? It wasn't fat. It wasn't carbs. It was processed food. Now, why does processed food make us gain weight? Well, we now have studies that show this. This is what we've learned as personal trainers, by the way. This is what I knew as a trainer working with people. This is what Adam and Justin saw themselves as well. Heavily processed foods make you eat more. So now you have you know, American culture, 60s and 70s, the introduction, or at least the all of a sudden processed foods started to become part of our daily lives. Now, at that time... It was still a staple to have, you know, a well cooked dinner. You know, you know, mom made dinner for you, and lunch was probably still made, and breakfast still people had eggs and bacon and that kind of stuff. But little by little, these meals were getting replaced by cereal, by you know, boxed processed foods, by microwave dinners became a thing for a little while. People started eating out more and more. That's considered heavily processed food. All these fast food restaurants started popping up, and. As we started to consume more processed food, our waists started to grow alongside them. Our weight started to go up alongside them. Now we have studies that actually show this. There was a one of the best studies that I've ever seen when it comes to nutrition. And I, I consider it one of the best because it was fully controlled. In other words, the people in the study were in a lab the whole time. And one of the problem with studies done on nutrition is that most of them are based off of surveys. So people will go in and then they'll ask them questions like, how often do you eat fruit? How often do you eat vegetables? How often do you... And surveys are just notoriously inaccurate. You know, people just, you ask somebody to estimate how many calories they eat, they're always off by 500 calories or more, sometimes thousands. But this study was done in a lab. It was controlled. And what they did is they took two groups of people. One group, they gave them unlimited access to unprocessed natural food. So like chicken and meat and eggs and milk and... Uh, you know, and, and, and fruits and vegetables and nuts and that kind of stuff. The other group had unlimited access to heavily processed foods. Believe it or not, this is how good the study was done. They even controlled for macros. The macros of each side were similar. So it wasn't like the heavily processed food side was all sugar and the other side was, you know, less sugar. No, they were pretty, they, they, they matched them up pretty damn well. Then here's what they did that was even more brilliant. They had them stay in their, in their, in their camps for a little while, eat as much as you want, eat as much as you want, both groups. Then they switched them. Then they switched them over just to make sure that it wasn't like these people over here just eat more and whatever. Then they switched them over. Do you know what they found? On average, and other studies have echoed this, on average, when people consume a lot of heavily processed foods, they eat around 500 more calories every single day. That's a pound of body fat a, a week. week. Yep. Okay? That's incredible. Wow. And that's a lot of food. Five. Now, how does this happen? Well, because hunger is not regulated, not just regulated by how many calories are in your food or how much it fills up your stomach. It has to do with a lot of different things. And processed foods are designed to make you eat more. They're, they're, they do a phenomenal job of doing this. So here's the difference. If you got processed foods and unprocessed foods in the same macros and same calories, you're going to have a way tougher time eating an appropriate amount if you eat well, processed foods. And that, foods. You're, you're using an example of a controlled study where they factored in what the calories had to be. My argument is that I would say that a majority of people, and we know this from other studies, uh, under-report. And they, sure. and they don't know how to calculate correctly. And it's hard to calculate correctly. Doug pulled up the article for me. It's actually the FDA allows 20% leeway north or south. So and they use the example. So a cliff car, a cliff bar, legally could say it's 200 calories or 300 calories. It could be literally a hundred calorie difference. Now, which one do you think they'll put on the label? Right, the one 200, 250. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they that's, use, that's a 20 percent variation up or down. Yeah, oh, okay. yes. So that that and that's on a small bar. That the the bigger the product is, the more exaggerated that can be. And that's one thing in your diet for that single day. You've got multiple things in your diet that is processed or packaged like that, or eating out. You could be miscalculating by 300 to 700 calories every day, which is typically about how many calories I'm telling a client to restrict or add to their diet based off of their goal. So if you're eating a lot of these foods and you think the the quote unquote macros align, they probably don't. So I mean, and now that all being said, 
That doesn't mean too that I'm also freaking out every time I eat. I mean, I had, you know, Mike Matthews, good friend of ours, sends us his his protein. He's always pushing his his, his products on us all the time, right? So, you know, fuck, I eat them. You know, he sends sends the chocolate chip bars in there all the time. I pick them out, and I was eating them yesterday. I don't freak out because I'm I'm eating a bar and going, oh my god, this could be off by 50 calories or whatever. If it's in your diet occasionally, it's not a, it's not that big of a deal where I think it's going to be. Uh, you you will or you won't get results, but it's important that you're mindful of these things. You're mindful of the points that Sal's making that when you eat highly processed foods, that it's it's created to hijack your palate and make you want to eat more. That's why it's designed. It's designed to do that. And then also, there's a good chance that it's off by a solid 20% north or south, and normally the direction that you don't want it to be off. Yeah, so I mean, keep that in, 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 in mind when you're eating that stuff. Yeah, and, and at, the, at the end of the day, do you want your do you want to be able to maintain a, a good body weight or body fat percentage, but do you want it to be a struggle? Like, do you want to have to like use willpower every damn day, or do you want it to feel a little bit more natural? Eating heavily processed foods is going to make it a lot harder. So regardless of what your goal is, uh, eating those types of foods just and I, and it means I'm and it counting if everything's equal as Adam said it probably not and we're not even going down the micro uh, nutrient path and we're not even talking about the other you know reasons why whole foods are usually healthier than unprocessed foods so there just is no comparison now again that being said here's what processed food is really good at because I'm not going to demonize it uh, I know it sounds like I'm demonizing it but here's the deal processed foods allowed us to feed a lot of fucking people. It's they don't go bad. I can ship them across the world. You know, there's a reason why in Hawaii spam has become a staple. A lot of people don't realize this, but when you go to Hawaii, spam and eggs and spam here. Like, why do they eat spam so much? Because we had soldiers stationed in Hawaii, and 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 how do you ship meat without it going bad? Uh, they made spam. You know, processed foods have value, um, and, and there's a reason why they exist, but they make you eat more. And I would say if you have the privilege of buying, you know, unprocessed food, it's going to make you, it's going to make it a lot easier for you to stay uh, lean and healthy. It just makes things a lot easier. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides. They cost nothing. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Adam at mindpumpadam, Justin at mindpumpjustin, and you can find me at mindpumpsal.